This is Leslie Kane, and you're listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. My name is Andy, and many of you get in touch with me on a regular basis asking how they can report their UFO sightings. So rather than me keep getting back to you telling you the same things, I thought it was about time to get another one of those experts on to discuss one of the best resources for reporting your UFO sightings, wherever you are around the world. So joining me on the podcast, I have the State Director of the Mutual UFO Network, MUFON, in Southern California. He is an investigator of more than 900 reports of UFOs, a member of MUFON's Experiencer Resource Team, a musician, and most importantly, a father and grandfather. Uh, Joining me on the podcast is Earl Gray Anderson. Errol, welcome to the podcast. Hi there. How are you doing, Andy? <laughs> it's very good to have you on. And we've been talking for a good few minutes now before I hit record about UFOs, the Beatles, and and a few things <laughs> in between, um, which was a lot of fun. But I told my wife earlier, and I did mention to you that when I said your name, she laughed because my wife's English and me with the Scottish accent, it's really hard to pronounce the name Earl. So if anyone, it's E A R L. So anyone who wonders, what is Andy saying this guy's name is? Um, it's Earl. That's it. And you might hear me change it as the interview goes on, just depending on what I'm saying. So Earl, very warm welcome to the podcast. Good Thank to have you, you on. Uh, we're going to get to talking about a few different things, including your time with MUFON, your work with MUFON. But um, I want to start off just asking you, how did you first get involved and the UFO topic, does it go back to childhood or was it? It a bit goes later? back to my earliest memories. Um, my mom, uh, her name was, was Betty Grace Anderson and she worked for Howard Hughes, the, the aerospace giant who, uh, he initially made his uh, fortune by creating the better drill bit for the oil fields. And, uh, but he was one of the first contractors to work with the Pentagon and, 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 uh, and my mom was working for him as one of his two private secretaries. And, uh, at this point, Hughes was uh, a germaphobe. Uh, he was uh, shut in. He did not like to leave his office. Uh, and so he would send my mom out. Uh, my mom had a very high security clearance because he would send her out to do his, you know, his business stuff. And my mom told me when I was about five years old about how she was taken out to the middle of the desert and there was this bunker in the middle of nowhere, had a little security detail with her. She did not tell me which desert it was, but that they opened this thing. It was all locked up and there was an elevator. And of course, this elevator only went down. There was no building over it for it to go up to. Uh, so she got into the elevator. She still didn't know where, where they were going. You know, she figured it was maybe a couple of floors down at most. And she said that she got in the elevator and it kept going down and that she felt uh, vertigo that she had the way she explained. She said, well, she had butterflies in her stomach. Uh, she said that the doors finally opened up and there was a little city under the desert. They got around in golf carts, she said. Uh, there were uh, some of the German rocket scientists worked there that we acquired through uh, Operation Paperclip. And uh, she talked about working in this little city under the desert uh, that, that uh, Hughes had a lab there. Uh, since then, I've met another guy who was an RAF pilot, and his mother happened to be the other secretary that, that worked with my mom. And uh, she told him the exact same story, that, uh, except she, she gave a little more detailed description. She said that it, this lab had a little catwalk over it. It was sort of like a, like a James Bond movie, but for, it was real. So that was the first weird story my mom told me. But then she kind of followed that up with talking about people like Werner von Braun that she knew. She said he was a charming man. I said, well, wasn't he a Nazi mom? How could he be charming? And she said, well, he yeah. wasn't really. He was forced to do that. But he he really, really wanted, you know, to for humans to go into space. And he, he was obsessed with going to the moon. And, of course, he was the guy that helped us design the three-stage rocket that got us there. Um, and the other thing my mom talked about a little bit when I was very, very young was life in the universe. She she spoke to she spoke about it with her as though she knew. And she said, well, we're not alone. 
we already know we're not alone. There's, there's, uh, you know, there's later on, like 1977. Now my mom shut up about it for years, but I took her to see a new movie that came out called Star Wars. And for some reason, I guess the stars aligned for me that day because she just did a little disclosure number with me. She said, son, you have no idea how close to the truth that movie is. The different races of aliens, the different spaceships, all of that. She said, it's really like that. And it's really, that's not far-fetched. And she said, uh, you know, all that is real. She said, it's, it's realer than you'll ever know. And that phrase stuck with me for many years. I tried to get her to talk a little bit more. I mean, I see you have Bob Lazar's book sitting there. Now, I asked my mom, like, 1999, uh, do you know about Bob Lazar? Do you ever hear of this guy? Because my mom went on to work as a, a, a corporate headhunter for the aerospace companies. That's what she did. Uh, she was still doing that up until, like, a couple years before she passed away. She passed away in 1999. And, uh, you know, Bob Lazar, and she kind of looked uncomfortable and she said, Bob Laser, that's not a real name. What do you mean? You know, <laughs> she would try to change the subject. Um, at one point when I was a kid, you know, I, I was talking about this at school and, and uh, a teacher actually did a parent teacher conference with my mom. And I got a little lecture driving home. I was 10 years old. And my mom said, you know, son, I'm not mad at you. How did you remember this stuff? I, you were a baby when I told you this. You were five years old. Uh, I wouldn't have told you if I thought you're going to remember it. And for God's sake, you can't talk about this to people and, and, and especially not at school. She said, uh, people don't know about this stuff. And she said, your mom could get into big trouble. Your mom could go to prison. And uh, So this is that that's the atmosphere I grew up in. And as I got older, after my mom passed, as long as she was alive, there was always a chance that she would give me a little more information about this subject. Mm. Um, but when my mom passed, I decided, uh, I started reading UFO books. Uh, I started kind of researching the whole subject for myself. And I felt like I hit a, you know, a brick wall. Uh, there were so many different attitudes and ideas out there, and, and, and they couldn't all be true. And that's when I decided to join MUFON and become a field investigator and, and actually investigate UFOs myself. And um, what year was that, Earl? Did you start uh, with MUFON? Mm -hmm. I started, uh, it was 2015 when I joined. Uh, at the end of 2015, that's when I became a field investigator. Uh, you, you take a test. Um, they mentor you. Uh, my friend Jeff Krause was the state director at that time. Uh, and he was my first uh, mentor in, in ufology. And, uh, and I learned a lot from Jeff. But, you know, there's nothing like feet on the ground, uh, getting your own cases. Uh, and I, I sort of went to it like a fish to water. And uh, you mentioned my 900 cases. I mean, I was just, I happened to look in, in this, the MUFON uh, computer management system the other day. It's like, I wonder how many cases I've done at this point. And I looked it up. And it was it was 900 and something at this point. So um, that's a lot of UFO cases. Out of that 900, there's about 80 that I have classified as actual UFOs. Uh, J. Allen Hynek, who, who is the head scientist with Project Blue Book, he, he kind of came up with a rule of thumb where he said uh, 90 to 95 percent of UFO reports that come in wind up being prosaic objects, something, you know, a natural phenomena or a man-made phenomena that people uh, misidentified. So my numbers are kind of that that's the same as Hynix, you know, it's, it's probably five to 8% uh, that, that wound up being UFOs. And, uh, and some of those cases are, are eye popping and, and mind blowing. And, uh, and they align with what my mom told me as a child. Um, I, at this point, I've even had people from the Department of Defense tell me that uh, I had one guy tell me, you can be very proud of your mom and, and the work that she did. She didn't lie to you. I've read her file. <laughs> I said, well, 
tell me a little bit more. What was she doing? You know, what was she doing under the desert and all that? And he said, I can't tell you because her file is sealed, but you can be very proud of her. Um, and that, that's, that's how it started for me. And I love it. You know, I, I feel like, uh, I don't know that anybody truly understands this phenomenon because it is weird. <laughs> and I think it's been with us forever and ever. I don't think it's a new thing. Well, um, let me say there's a lot to dive into <laughs> there, Earl. And your your mum, it certainly sounds like, lived an incredible life. And again, yes. we talked about the mystique of the Beatles before we recorded. And it sounds like, and we talked about how, you know, if the Beatles hadn't broken up, what could have been? But it's almost the myth around them is, is even bigger because we don't know. And same with mm -hmm. your mum, you know, almost, I'm sure there's a frustration. You don't mm -hmm. know what your mother actually did, yeah, what she I saw, don't. what she witnessed. But it, it, there's I, that imagination. It's almost childlike, isn't it? That yeah. it's, it's bigger than the real than the real thing. I kind of, I'm one of my, I, I, a, a good guess of it. Though my mom was a computer expert, and this was before the internet and all that. Um, and, and she, she had this office where she trained people, uh, all the various computer systems. And, uh, this was when she was working, uh, as, as a, as a corporate headhunter. And, uh, she learned how to do that somewhere. Uh, and, and I, I imagine that it was back when she was working with Hughes. Um, I, I've, I've had another case where, uh, the, this one family, their, their father, told the same story that my mom told me, but they, they knew where it was. They had, they, they had actually seen where their father worked and it was in White Sands, New Mexico. And it was an underground computer base. And this was back around 1961. Uh, my mom was working under the desert for Hughes back 1955 until I was born. She said that uh, she was still working there when she was pregnant with me. And uh, in May, May 29th of 1958, that she officially quit because that was the day I was born. Um, but uh, that, that's something strange, too. You know, when I was uh, when I was maybe 21 years old, I was trying to get my mom to talk more. I was just kind of get, get frustrated. And, well, mom, tell me a little bit more. What were you doing under the desert? You never said any, you know, told me any details. And she'd get frustrated. She'd sort of raise an eyebrow and walk out of the room because, you know, she couldn't, she couldn't say. Um, but this one time she turned around and she came back and she said, I'm not, I can't tell you much, but I'll tell you one thing. You were down there. And I said, what do you mean I was down there? She said, I was pregnant with you. So technically you were down in the little city under the desert as well. Uh, I don't remember it, but there you go. Um, I don't know. But, maybe but they did something right. to me down there and make me such a, a you know, <laughs> a weirdo. She, she was right. Oh, well, listen, we're all weirdos in this together. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I want to know, you mentioned, Earl, you, you joined MUFON in 2015. Now, that's that's been now, as we record this, for 2023. Uh, my maths were eight years. You've been there seven and a half, eight years, probably. Mm -hmm. And that's been a really interesting time because 2017, we had the New York Times article drop mm -hmm. and the UFO subject took a, a bit of a change and a fork in sure the road did. for many. So you were there through 2015, 16 into 17. Did you see much of a change from those first couple of years in the UFO yes. subject to what happened then in 2017? Well, people ask me all the time, when do you think disclosure is going to happen? And I tell them it already did. It was on the front page of the New York Times, you know, and that was the whole Tic Tac uh, UFO thing that happened with the USS Nimitz and, and the Princeton. Kevin Day, you know, was the, the, the head radar deck guy. And uh, this was on the front page of the New York Times talking about the Tic Tac uh, off of Catalina Island. And apparently it started out with a fleet of UFOs that they were catching on, on the radar. Uh, and they saw them for about a week coming down out of low Earth orbit down to sea level and then shooting back up. And at first they thought that the the radar, it was, it was a new radar system that was very detailed. And they thought that maybe they were having problems with it. They had it, everything checked out. The radar unit was working perfectly. There was nothing wrong with it. So after about a week, they sent a squadron of planes out to see what was going on. 
and that's where you've got that video that was uh, surreptitiously released to the public first. I mean, the the Department of Defense, they were their hand was forced, is what happened. They, they, they couldn't deny it. Anybody that had a background in science knew what that video showed. Um, and th- this thing was traveling 18 times the speed of, of sound. Uh, it was at Mach 18. It didn't create a single sonic boom, which should be impossible. Had some way of negating the mass of that ship. And so, it, you know, if you can negate the, the mass in something, you can technically travel faster than the speed of light. That's the only thing that makes Einstein's speed limit work. Um, so it was something very strange. It was making 90 deg- degree turns uh, at, at Mach 18. I mean, if, if somebody was craft, and I imagine that it had a pilot, uh, yeah, why do you make a drone that's 40 feet across and 20 feet wide? I mean, there's no reason, you know, there, there's yeah. no reason to make a drone that big. That's like a HAB module. Um, did that, but did if that you make a 90 out? degree turn, you're going to be like jelly on the wall, you know, but yeah, they're using something that we don't have. Did, did that change <laughs> how, how you were viewing the UFO subject from that point on? Um, it didn't so much change the way that I viewed the UFO subject as much as it did the public. Um, what I noticed was before, before that article was on the front page of the times, people, you know, science backgrounds and stuff would roll their eyes at me. Uh, you know, my, my, uh, ex-father-in-law worked on the Apollo program and I'd talk about UFOs and he would laugh, you know, he thought it was, you know, so much BS and, uh, everything seemed to shift. Uh, I, you know, I probably have more friends who are scientists uh, doctors, you know, people with a science background that are colleagues now than, than anything. Um, people take it very, very seriously. Congress is certainly taking it seriously. I mean, Congress has been meeting with MUFON openly. Uh, I think they've always probably had a back door into MUFON because, you know, it's, it's a department of defense. They can do pretty much what they want they want to read something or see something, you know, they can get into your files, people. Um, but now here they are out and openly saying, yes, we want to work with MUFON. Uh, and, and that boy, oh boy, that's, that's a sea change. That is saying openly to everybody. Yes, we are taking this very, very seriously. This is a real thing. Um, so it's shifted. <laughs> And listen, let, let's talk about MUFON then, mm-hmm. because as an organization, I I know about it, and there are many listeners who will know about it. It's the Mutual UFO Network. However, I think sometimes it can go under the radar, pardon the pun, you know, talking about radar decks <laughs> and all, that there are so many listeners out there who don't know about MUFON because people get in touch with me purely because they listen to this podcast for their UFO news or other podcasts and they don't know how to submit reports. They don't know where to talk about their sightings. So there are people out there who don't know what it is. So what is the Mutual UFO Network? Um, We are a private organization. We're civilians. Uh, uh, We're a nonprofit. We all do this for the love of the phenomena and to understand the phenomenon. Um, we, we opened doors when Project Blue Book closed theirs. Project Blue Book was the government's first official, officially announced uh, investigation of the UFO phenomenon. And they closed doors in 1969, and that's when MUFON opened theirs in 1969. And if you go to MUFON.com, M-U-F-O-N.com, it's a mutual UFO network is what the acronym stands for. Um, the first thing you'll see is uh, you'll have a little uh, a little button that says uh, report a UFO. And there's another one, report an entity. So if, if somebody is, has been abducted or had a visitation or if they've had a close encounter with a craft or uh, seen a craft from afar, uh, you can put in a report about it. And uh, if you like me, we'll call you up and talk with you on the phone. Um, for some cases, I'll go out to the site, you know, if, if there was a, a landing observed or, or, or a crash or something that was on, uh, you know, street level, 
kind of stuff, um, I, I, I've got uh, people that can go out and, and, and take samples and, and we, we know how to do that, you know. Uh, and that's that's worldwide as well, isn't it? That no MUFON is a worldwide are... uh, organization, and we we do have a new uh, director of uh, a European director, and he lives in uh, the UK. So, and and we get uh, sighting reports from the UK all the time, but not not as many as we should. Uh, I know, uh, you know, I, I write a, a regular column for Outer Limits magazine. It's a British UFO periodical. Yep. Um, and I hear from people all the time about UFO sightings and stuff in, in the UK and, and elsewhere uh, over the pond. And oftentimes they, like you were saying, they don't know where to report them or where somebody will take them seriously. And, and you know, people tell me, oh, I try, I called the Air Force, I called the NSA, you know, I called, yeah, and, and well, they're they're either going to sweep it under the floor or uh, if, 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 anybody else saw that ufo they're certainly not going to tell you but if you get a hold of mufon uh if what you saw was something like spacex or or a drone or something like that we can you know we, we're we're very good at at figuring out what's in videos and, and what photographs you know people have um chances are i can tell you what it was that you saw uh, if it was a UFO, um, I will tell you that. <clears throat> if other people let, saw it, I'll, I'll let you know that. Let me ask, Earl, because that's a really good point. So I think mm -hmm. it goes without saying that I'm I'm a believer. I'm a fan of the UFO subject. For I mean, God, I've got a podcast on it. Not long <laughs> before I started the podcast, I had my, my second substantial sighting in my life where I saw a black triangle Ooh. not too far from where I live, about 100 feet in the air. Um, it wasn't high up. Um, another witness saw it but I was driving at the time I've told the story a few times on mm. the podcast but for your benefit I'll share it so apologies folks if some of you have heard this already I was driving home from work it was about 6 p.m roughly and you can take the the busy highway as you would call it the motorway home and you sit in traffic or you can take a kind of back back country road and it's quieter but still pretty busy so I'm not saying this was a you know secluded area by any means and coming along a road very very close to an airport uh, very close to newcastle airport so i'm very aware of aircraft coming in um going along the road there was a plane coming along kind of as if i'm driving along the road there was a, an aircraft coming in but as i got closer aircraft didn't seem to have moved and i'm very aware having seen it myself aircraft especially at night in the dark can look like they're not moving depending on wind speed and position of the lights and the driving speed and all that kind of stuff so I saw it, nah, these two lights still hadn't moved. Got a bit closer again. Those two lights definitely look like they're very, very low down, just above a kind of tree line that was next to me. <laughs> I then notice, as my as my right turn is coming up, a white van had pulled over at the side of the road, and it wasn't a very safe place to pull over. And as I get past the van, the guy is hanging out his van, looking up. And I look up at the same time again as I pass under the two lights, no other lights on. Normally, an aircraft coming in towards the airport has the flashing landing lights and the gears, or you see the windows or the tail. There's other. There's more than just those two lights. As I pass under it, against the black night sky, I can make out it's a black triangular shape. Wow. Now, the two lights were only on the back of the triangle. There was nothing on the front. So mm. there would be, normally you would expect to see something or make out the outline. I wouldn't have seen it had the two lights not being there. It could have sat perfectly still against the night sky and I wouldn't have seen it. But it was definitely about 100, 150 feet at most in the air. So by the time I managed to turn the car around on a very busy, fast road, I see in my rearview mirror that it started moving off diagonally over the treetops. Hmm. Another light had come on the front of it and I spoke to David Marler, who obviously is one of the world's, if not the world's foremost expert. Dave, in black Dave knows his triangles. He, he <laughs> certainly does. And I told him this, and he said he'd never heard of this before. Another light came on at the front of the craft that seemed to flash very sporadically. Hmm. This hadn't been on before. So as I tried to go back, I got round the basically where the tree line was. I traced my, my path along. It then opens up to an expanse of field, which then leads over to the airport. So... If it's an aircraft, it would have still been there. There was nothing there. So it mm. was gone. That was it. So that wow. was that was like a sighting for me. However, my point being, I then went home 
told my wife very excitedly. She told me, and at the time sort of gave me the idea down the line to start a podcast just with an off-the-cuff comment, and here we are. I didn't report that to anyone, and here's me who was a, a <laughs> fan of the UFO subject, a believer, someone who had an avid interest in UFOs. I didn't phone the police. I didn't report it, you know, to the, the aviation authorities. I didn't go on to MUFON. That didn't cross my mind. Hmm. If I had gone to MUFON.com and filled a report, what could I have expected to happen? Well, somebody would have called you for MUFON. We would have asked you, you know, the date, the time, although, you know, it, there's a place for you to type that in on on, on the sheet that you, you fill in if you are sight, putting in a sighting report. Um, I would, how, how did it make you feel seeing this? And did you feel, I, I, how, did, how did it make you feel? Do you know what? It's really strange that looking back, I wish I'd pulled over and just stopped the car in front of the van, even though it was a pretty fast road, 60 miles an hour. And I could have filmed. Mm. I was, because I was driving, I couldn't get my phone one handed to start <laughs> filming even if I had, and we're going to get to this, I don't think you'd have seen much with the camera phone against a very fast moving sky. You would have barely made out the lights, yeah. even I think. That's why um, they're painted black. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. Do you feel yeah. like it was um, an alien craft or do you feel like it, may, it might have been one of ours? That's that's my... my so I, I've said before, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure trying to be consistent that I've said, I just got the feeling it... it it was it was ours, but mm. not not an aircraft, for example. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know why, but the first thing that came to mind, I phoned my wife while I was watching it, and I basically talked and commented through what I was seeing. It mm. was the first thing that came to mind. Um, and I, I totally understand and appreciate now all those people who they say they saw something, but they forget to get their phone out. <laughs> or they, they don't film it because what you think you yeah. would do you don't necessarily do in that situation no if you're really close to one and and uh now I, with the black triangles i i kind of think that they are probably ours but i think that it's that we did reverse engineering of alien mm-hmm. craft to figure out how to do this um because you can't really i mean a couple of people that were trying to mess with anti-gravity uh by using highly electrified magnetic fields and things like that, but uh, anyway, I, 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 there's there's really no line of inventions leading up to the black triangles, you know. But I was talking with one guy who is uh, well. I've had a lot of aerospace engineers uh, re- report these. Uh, I've had police officers report them. I had one police officer that was about thirty five feet away from one. Uh, he, he was taking his dogs out at midnight. He was off duty. Uh, he lived at the foot of Bakersfield airport. And this thing was hanging at the end of the flight path of the airport. And he said that he could see indentations in the side and it looked like, uh, like hydraulics, like you would see in an aircraft carrier, uh, is how he mentioned it. I guess that he had had a background in the Navy and he said it really, it reminded me of the hydraulics that you'd see in an aircraft carrier. And, you know, usually when there's alien UFOs, they, they seem to be one off, you know, I mean, you have flying disc shape that's pretty popular, but, you know, I mean, we have blocky looking UFOs that look like a, a, a there was one in, in, in Crawford, Texas that they scrambled jets out on that was, they called it the flying Walmart because it looked like this big flying box with windows on the side. So um, I think that there's it's very distinct uh, difference between craft that are ours and theirs, theirs, <laughs> you know? and uh, but I think that they have the same source. I think that you know the Roswell crash happened back in 1947. I'd be kind of disappointed if we hadn't figured out how some of that technology worked in the last 74 years. You know that they've had. Do you know the- Work the on. one thing you, you mentioned about the black triangles, mm-hmm. popular opinion, I think, tends to be, I say that, this is just my opinion, what pop, popular opinion may be, is that it's our technology reverse engineered or some kind of shared technology. What's always put doubt in my mind with that and just made me question it more is, speaking of David Marlar, he was on Unidentified, the series with Tom DeLong, Chris Mellon, mm-hmm. Llewellyn, 
title. And he had Chris Mellon at his property. And Chris Mellon shared his thoughts on what he thought Black Triangles were potentially doing. And he felt they were surveying or mapping the planet. Mm. Just always Could thought be. if that was our technology, we would David, be mapping David the planet. David thinks that they're uh, extraterrestrial. Uh, we we kind of differ on that. But I mean, I'm open to either or. I, I don't know. Um, I had one aerospace engineer that works for, uh, should I say the name of the company? Maybe not. Ah, why not? Lockheed Skunk Works. <laughs> okay, I won't yeah. tell you which which uh, facility he works at. They have a few. But he's got it's like 90 company. people yeah. that work under him. And he told me off the cuff, he said, uh, you're 95% correct about the black triangles uh, coming from us, Earl. And... Well, I've been over to plant for uh, plant uh, forty two over in Palmdale uh, is is the Skunk Works plant over there, and they have a satellite that's owned by Boeing that's part of the same facility. So the guy, the 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 supervisor of the engineers uh, at Lockheed, I, I said, all right, so it's ninety five percent yours. So I'm guessing that that means it's five percent Boeing's then that Boyne worked with you guys. And he looked shocked and his mouth kind of dropped. We were on a Zoom call, right? He looked horrified. Uh, and he said, I didn't say that. I didn't say <laughs> So that may be, it may be a joint project between those two aerospace companies. I've had aerospace engineers report them. And, and the one guy, he was out by Plant 42. He, he was working late. It was three o'clock in the morning, and he described exactly what you just described. Uh, it was a, a black triangle. Uh, the lights were off, but he could see it blot out the stars. And he said this thing flew right over him, silent as could be. Hmm. And uh, and he saw it hover over the gate of Planet 40, and he said, and it landed like a feather. He said, I've never seen anything so beautiful or so graceful. And he said, uh, do you happen to know how I could work on that project? That was, that was the way we finished the, the phone call. I told him, well, I don't, my mom might have been able to have helped you, but I'm I, not sure. <laughs> you know, that was not the, strange sure movement. It. the strange movement for me was the way it moved off diagonally, very hmm. steadily yeah. over the, there was no turn, there was no dipping no, of there's, a wing. There's no just... forward or reverse on these things. They can yeah. go any direction they want. Uh, they... I had one guy that saw one of the black triangles that was hovering sideways. So mm. he could see the, the top of it. It was just hovering sideways. So they must have gravity uh, worked out in, 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 in the, the cabin somehow where people have been hitting the wall. You know? Anyone inside? Yeah. I think so. I'm pretty darn sure they're manned. Why would they make them so huge? You know, some of them are the size of a football field. They have uh, three sizes, is what I've been told. There's one that's about the size of a fighter uh, plane. Uh, there's one that's uh, about the size of uh, half the size of a football field. And then there's a big one that they've got. Um, but Let again, you know, I don't know. These might, these might not be ours. I mean, people say a lot of funny things out there. Um, and, and I'm sure the technology came from... Uh, came from elsewhere uh, well, let they, me ask earl wh mm -hmm. when you get a report what does the average report that comes through to mufon look like what what kind of details do you get and then i'd love you to follow up with what would you like to get on top of that sure well um it, it'll it'll tell the time the place uh i'll find the coordinates i'll find the weather patterns for that area <clears throat> um sometimes people will submit a video or a photograph um, a lot of sightings wind up being prosaic objects. I mean, the little hobby drones, they make them to look like UFOs now, and they have the lights that spin around. And I had uh, some woman thought that her son had been terrorized by a UFO. She sent uh, this report in, and I'm watching the video, and she said, it, it's been following my son. And I looked at the rep I looked at the video, and it was of a it was a hobby drone. So somebody was maybe spying on her son, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but it wasn't aliens. I have, but then you know, I I have so many you know, a lot of reports of um, of abductions and visitations, and I think that if you the closer you get 
to the phenomena and the, and the, and when you start poking at it, uh, I've, I've had an experience myself, uh, seven years ago, my wife and I had a weird anomalous where our room flooded with light. I, I became paralyzed and I had beings come through the wall. And this was not something that my, uh, that my state wanted to hear. He was kind of a nuts and bolts guy about the phenomenon mm. And and his feeling was was that this doesn't happen but once in a blue moon, it is very uncommon. Uh, but working for the experience resource team at MUFON, uh, abductions and visitations are very very common. Actually, I would say one out of a hundred p- persons is probably an abductee or a visitee. Um, and and for a long time it was a DNA farming thing that was going on. Uh, now it's more downloads. And- and it seems like um, they're getting, maybe getting us ready for actual full-on disclosure. Um, because I, I think that there's a fear of how we're going to react. I mean, that's what my mom my mom said way back in the 70s. She said, they're never going to tell the public this, Earl, because they're afraid of how people are going to react. People, you know, they, they, you know, she brought up the H.G. Wells uh, War of the Worlds radio cast. Uh, back in the 1930s, and people were jumping yeah. out of windows and off of buildings and draining their bank accounts. And um, and I imagine, you know, just seeing the way that people act now, um, they're probably afraid that people would start shooting at, at them or, you know, I mean, I don't. Uh, so I think that we're being prepared, probably. Do and, you think the public are more desensitized now, though, than, than they were 80 or 90 yes. years ago? But uh, I think people... Maybe they are more accepting. Yeah, but I think as long as it's like there might be aliens, you know, or yeah. UFOs might be real, people seem to be okay with that. But as soon as they find out, no, they're living here among us and, and they have are interacting with people and uh, they're kind of in charge, uh, I think people are going to probably not react so well to that. I mean, we know that they can turn nuclear weapons off and on. I mean, we've seen them do it. My friend, uh, Bob Salas, he was a commander of a nuclear base in Montana, and uh, a UFO hovered over the nuclear base, and he was downstairs with the ICBMs, and he watched as each one was taken offline. It was like, bip, 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 bip. <laughs> so that those were our, you know, weapons of mass destruction. And and this saucer is hovering upstairs. The the guard that was still up on top was yelling over the radio, oh my God, you know, it's it's a flying saucer. Well, Bob was busy downstairs because our, our nation's security was at jeopardy. Um and then he watched as each missile was put back online so it was like bit 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 taking them offline and then they brought them back online and, and it was a show of power just like i think the tic tac event was you know the tic tac played cat and mouse with those with that squadron of planes they couldn't keep up with it and it you know that when when it finally took off this was over in in uh 2004 near Catalina Island with the the aircraft carrier, the USS Nimitz and the destroyer, the Princeton, um, the squadron, they, they had a cap point, which was a random predetermined uh, coordinate. And it wasn't just uh, latitude and longitude, but it was also, you know, the height that they were yeah. going to meet at was all figured out. Well, they said, okay, well, we don't tic tac anywhere. Uh, we're going to meet back at the cap point. And they got a radio radio from, from the Nimitz. They said, well, don't look now, but the the UFO is, is waiting at your cap point for you. Yeah. This wasn't in their computer. It wasn't spoken of on the radio. It was a secret. It was secret coordinates. So either this thing read their minds or I don't know. I don't know how they knew. As, as far as I remember <laughs> with the cap, with the cap point, it had been used several times before the incident, and mm. those tic tacs had been there for a week before the intercept. Mm-hmm. So there's potential that it's a learned behavior that mm. they're also mimicking the fact that we know you're going to this point. So yeah, much like well, it was a, a pet, show of power, almost. you know. Yeah, I mean, played cat and mouse with those planes. 
Uh, there was nothing they could do. They couldn't catch up with it. I mean, this thing was traveling at Mach 18, <laughs> making 90 degree turns. It was like a roadrunner, you know, wily e. coyote cartoon, you know, where the, I mean, physics, they, they dictate that objects are, are able to do certain things. If you're traveling Mach 18, you're going to have 18 sonic booms. There was not one single spoon that this thing made, you know. I want to ask you a question, Earl, just mm-hmm. before I talk to you about some of the more spectacular cases that you've looked at. You mentioned the, sure. you know, the abductions or landings potentially. Mm-hmm. On those more prosaic cases, so I mentioned just before I hit record with you, one of the listeners sent me a DM, uh, JJ, thank you very much, mm-hmm. and JJ's daughter had been out to try and film a comet last night that was passing over the Earth. What she ended up filming was a, a light in the sky. Mm. It's frustrating because it's a very similar video to what i see quite often and it's not down to the the lack of the witness being incorrect it's the technology we have that the camera phones never look as good as the naked eye Mm -hmm. and he tells me he doesn't think it was starlink it is just a light against a black sky um and i asked if there was any more information and he said nope trying to film the comet, saw this instead, went back out a few minutes later, but nothing was there. Um, Hmm. And I wonder, that must be something, one, that you get quite a lot, just the the light against the dark sky. But what could people do that would help yourself or other investigators follow that up? Um, One thing that people can do is is, uh, you can get, uh, there, there are certain apps that like star... Oh, what's it called? Starwalk, I think, is one uh, where it, it it gives you you can see what's supposed to be up there in the night sky. Mm-hmm. Um, also, there's the flight radar app that you can get to find out if it's you know one of ours or or it's a, a plane or it, it you know if it's something that's supposed to be up there, it'll be you know the the FAA number and everything will be there. Yeah. Um, also, I will get satellite tracker. There's a very good satellite tracker app. Of course, we have spy satellites. Everybody has them, and those aren't going to be on the spy tra- on, on the satellite tracker app. Yeah, because there's there's spy satellites. <laughs> yeah. So it could be any one of those things, or it could be it could be a spaceship from Alpha Centauri. As far as but, but lights in the sky are frustrating. About the best I can do is tell you if Jupiter, Venus, or some, you know, or, or if the ISS was passing over. That can yeah. look sort of like a lit up cross shape when it goes over. I, I you know, I, I have another app, ISS uh, Tracker, and my wife and I like to go outside and watch it fly over. You know, it's uh, there, there's the space station, honey. Look. Uh, <laughs> I see the ISS quite often here as well. And it's yeah. cool to think, wow, there's this object going overhead with a couple of people on Just board. Just tick them off, you know, what it was, wasn't, was right? And at yeah. the uh, end of the day, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll usually have an answer for the person, but lights in the sky, again, can be really frustrating because it could be a helicopter way in the distance uh, or it could be Star Trek, <laughs> you know? Um, well, listen, let's let's get a bit more Star Trek then, because you mentioned <laughs> 900 plus reports, 90 to 95 percent of them are explainable. It's mm-hmm. something prosaic. But that's that's a good thing, because we want to be able to explain a way that we can get to the yes. better quality data. And that that includes what the, the US government are doing just now with the Arrow or, uh, program. And the the fact that we're getting more and more reports from pilots and people can get frustrated when they hear, oh, well, 50% of them have been solved. Well, that means 50% haven't. And even if 5% of that 50 that haven't been solved still remain unexplained after a period Mm -hmm. of time, that's some really good quality data to look into. And I wonder, in those 900 reports, what are some of the standout cases that you've been involved in or you've had the fortune to look at? I had uh, uh, one sighting that happened a few years ago where two women followed after uh, a spherical uh, red glowing ball that was flying through Azusa, California. Uh, A to Z uh, USA is, is, is Azusa. It's, it's an acronym, and they named the city A to Z uh, USA. But Azusa. 
Um, and they, they followed this UFO through town. They did a chase through town <laughs> and they wound up stuck in a cul-de-sac next to this park and they couldn't go any further. And they watched this thing go travel over to the, to the San Bernardino mountains, uh, mountain range that's there. And it was just hovering. I could do what we call the falling leaf motion. It was sort of going back and forth, hovering in place. Um, they're watching this little tiny ball when all of a sudden everything lights up behind them. They turn around. They're out of their car at this point, And there was a flying saucer that was hovering like 100 feet away from them. I mean, it's almost like they were chasing the UFO and they maybe sent a bigger one to chase them. Um, so these women watched this. It seemed to to go in and out of existence. I think that it had sort of a, like like a invisibility shield kind of thing that was either misoperating or I, I don't know. But they would watch it sort of disappear and then reappear. It had four big bright lights that were inside of like on the bottom of this craft, and it was technically a flying saucer. Uh, well, we got a third report from five miles away. There is an ex-Air uh, Force officer that lived uh, in the next town over. And he saw this from five miles away, and he put in a report as well. So there were three different good witnesses for this uh, sighting. Um, I had BuzzFeed come out with a camera crew and interview. the. I mean, you know, it was just a very, very good case. Um, other wonderful cases. Uh, uh, I mean, I have so many of them. I, I, I am, it, it's just like a, an embarrassment of riches is the way I see it. Now I may have, you know, personally I've, I've investigated 900 cases mm -hmm. and many of those wound up being, you know, uh, drones and, and stars or, or planets and something that people misidentified. But you got to remember, out of that number, about eighty of those wound up being UFOs, and they're and they're all solid cases. I mean, I I tell people you can go ahead and try and tear my cases apart. I want you to. <laughs> so far, nobody's been able to debunk a single one, you know, because I'm very very thorough. That's a lot of UFOs. That's just you know, that's I there there's eight other eight to 10 other field investigators here in Southern California that work under me. Those are just my UFOs. All those guys have, you know, a number of, of unknowns as well. So you have to add all those unknowns together. That's pretty darn good for seven years. It's probably up somewhere around maybe hundred UFOs that are confirmed um, unknowns. Uh, unknown doesn't mean it came from another planet, but it it doesn't mean it didn't come from another sure. planet. Sure. You know. <laughs> That's what it says on the tin, yeah. One of the listeners got in touch, Tom, who lives out in Kentucky, hmm. and he says that he regularly searches the MUFON database, and he hmm. sees videos and comments that are posted by individuals. And he had a couple of questions. Um, sure. Is there any follow-up done on these and if so, how is that then reported on the database? So if someone does send in a video, do you get to see the follow-up and the follow-on comments as well? Um, well, we, we do want to keep people a lot. There There is a way that you can stay anonymous if you have a sighting. And I just, I try to keep people anonymous anyway. I'm a, a, a old retired nurse and we had to go by what they call HIPAA law. And it's very yeah. kind of strict. You, you can't give a person's information out. And so I'm used to sort of those parameters and I kind of treat my witnesses with the same care because there still is a uh, ridicule out there. If you say that you've been abducted, especially, you know, mm. um, I'm, I'm going to be on ancient aliens uh, on February 10th, the place. Not sure when it will play in the UK, but uh, it's this season, and it's a little scary because I'm talking about the the visitation that my wife and I experienced, and I I know well that you know there's going to be some people that are going to say, did you get probed? You know, no, I didn't get probed. Um, <laughs> there's so I'm very careful with 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 people's identities and their reports. But I do put them out there. I mean, I do a lot of podcasts, a lot of radio and, and, and television, and, and uh, I'm not, uh, 
Uh, it's not like we, we're not like the black hole of, of UFO reports. I make sure that if it's a good UFO sighting, that it gets out to people. I put it on social media if I have a really good case. Um, I do teach a class, uh, a accredited college class in ufology at Otis College of Art and Design here in Los yep. Angeles. And I'll, I'll teach my class with my own cases. And, uh, you know, I mean, I've got a lot of flying saucer cases. I've got multiple abduction and visitations. Uh, one, one guy was literally abducted through the roof of his barracks at a major uh, marine base here in, in Southern California. He was taken through the roof. He was taken up to a, a, a ship. And, and, uh, and this guy, was he had PTSD from his alien encounter. He, he went to Vietnam and fought. And he didn't have PTSD from going to war. Uh, he finally, his, his kids told him about MUFON and said, well, maybe you can get some help and somebody to at least talk with you and explain some of the stuff. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful UFO report, but kind of a scary case. Um, I have another case recently where a, a young girl was living in a national park. Her father was a park ranger, very remote. And they, they started seeing lights, and she had an encounter where she was healed of a lung condition that uh, they, they didn't think that she would live through puberty. She was only about 8 to 10 years old. And, uh, and she, she was abducted or visited. She's not sure which happened because her memory is, you know, I guess that she could get hypnotic uh, regression if she wanted to, to, to mm. maybe get that memory back. But she's just happy to know. She remembers seeing the entities. Uh, they were very gentle and kind with her, and they they cured her. She went on to live a normal life. She's in her mid fifties now, and she never had another problem with her lungs. And uh, she wasn't supposed to live to puberty, is what they thought. So um, it's just a very strange phenomena. But I don't think they're here to attack us. I don't think they're here to invade us. If they're going to invade us, they're doing a, a poor job of it. You know, they've been here since at least 1947. And here we are. I mean, our greatest threat is still mankind. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that's, you know, they, they have not dropped any bombs on us. They haven't dropped any nukes on us. They haven't threatened to do that. But here we, you know, are, uh, God, you know. We're doing a good job of that on our We're own. We're doing a good right. job uh, on our own. <laughs> er, er, Earl, I want to know, do, can we ever get that smoking gun evidence? Now, you mentioned earlier you feel, and many mm -hmm. people have heard say the same thing, disclosure has already happened. But when it comes to, let's call it confirmation, 100% proof that we have an extraterrestrial intelligence or some other non-human intelligence uh, visiting the planet, do you see that sort of confirmation coming from reporting to an organization like MUFON? Is it going to be through a private organization like the Galileo Project or some sort of official body like NASA? Where do you see this playing out? I think that if they truly do full-on disclosure, and I don't know that they ever are going to, I don't know that the aliens themselves want us to disclose. I think that they're doing just fine the way it is, you know, uh, you know, they appear to who they want to appear. And, and, and a lot of people don't believe that they're even a real thing. So, mm. you know, that, that's, that's a pretty good uh, status. If you're trying to figure out a race, if you're trying to investigate a, a, a alien race, which we would be. Um, but if it, it does happen, I don't know who they're going to get to disclose. Uh, there, there's, you know, we're kind of a, our country is politically divided right now and it's gotten to a fever pitch where nobody really trusts half of the country doesn't think that the president who's in office is supposed to be there. And the last president, half of the country didn't think that he should be there. Um, and, and I think that, you know, people will say, oh, you know, fake news, right? So it would have to be a coordinated effort. I think it would have to be other countries involved. It would maybe be the United Nations enough to do it. Um, I think that NASA and the various science organizations would have to come out. I notice that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has kind of walked back his old skepticism recently, mm. UFOs. 
Very yeah. interesting. He was sort of like the big skeptic and rolling his eyes. And, and he, I just saw him on a, on a show the other day and he said that UFOs might actually be uh, alien space. Yeah. That's, that's new. That's, that's a big step for, for old Neil. <laughs> so we'll see, you know, I mean, attitudes are changing out there. They'd have to get people like him and maybe Michio Kaku would be a good one. Uh, Michio is great. He already pretty much, he, he thinks that uh, some UFOs are, are, are UFOs, you know? Yeah. Uh, he's, 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 he's an open-minded scientist. So we would need people like that to do it, I think. And MUFON, of course, you know, and that's what I'm cool. doing right now. And that's what I, it's my passion is, is letting people know this is a very, very real phenomena. Uh, it's, it's a personal phenomena and uh, we're not alone. And it's, it's, that's wonderful. You know, what does mm. the future hold for MUFON in 2023? How is it as an organization that's now been around for decades? How is it changing and adapting to stay relevant? especially as technology and digitalization become more and more prevalent. Yeah, we well, we've gone, you know, uh, all the files are kept uh, on a computer base now, a mainframe. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, if you watch the old Hainer 1 show, you see the old Hainer that MUFON had and the boxes mm -hmm. that files were in and their yeah. paper files. And I even, ha I, I have some paper files still from when I first started up. We, we would still use them, you know, every now and then. But uh, now it's all, all kept online. It's all very modern and, and digitized. Um, we also have MUFON television. It's a wonderful database full of, you know, that you can, you can subscribe to it for a reasonable price. And uh, MUFON also, uh, we have our, sympo our symposium every year. I'm actually on the symposium board. You, yeah, yeah I'm, 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 I'm a member of the symposium uh, executive board. There's three of us. I'm, I'm a busy man. Um, and we're just kind of getting, uh, I, I know we have Avi Loeb, uh, PhD, who's going to be speaking in, in August. Uh, we have our symposium in Ohio this year. And uh, that's going to be wonderful. I almost got Jock Valet, he, he, but he's got asthma, I guess, that he was worried for his health uh, going around that many people. But uh, the symposium no, that's... seems wonderful. Uh, and we're, Can people we're... attend the symposium mm -hmm. in person and virtually? Yeah. Um, virtually, you can, um, yes, you can, you can get, they, they, they do uh, like stream the symposium. So you can, you can be in the UK and go to the symposium uh, remotely. Mm -hmm. Well, that information I'll put on the, the podcast as well, Earl. Um, what I want to ask, what do you see, just to wrap up, as MUFON's biggest challenge going forward as an organization? Um, well, now that Congress is openly working with us, I think that the biggest challenge would be uh, just challenges of working with officialdom, you know? And I think that there's probably different motives in there, like there usually are. And just remaining true to our core, uh, our core mission statement, which is a very, very good mission statement. I mean, MUFON's mission statement is the scientific investigation of UFOs for the benefit of humanity, um, and that's that's it, <laughs> you know. And and that's it says a lot, though, you know. It's it's for the benefit of of humankind that that we're doing this. Uh, because the the technologies involved and 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 just the knowledge, uh, once we figure out anti gravity, once we figure out uh, interstellar flight or interdimensional flight or whatever whatever it is that they use to get from there to here, uh, it's going to change. It's going to change us. It's going to be like Star Trek if we can you know harness those uh, energies. And I think that maybe that's why sightings and everything are ramping up, that they are watching us carefully. They're probably worried about us. I don't think they want Star Wars, you know, Star Trek. Yeah, sure. You know, but not Star Wars. And I think that they're they're interested in our military. They're interested in how we comport ourselves. And I think that that's another intelligence that's not humanity. That's 
And it's very, it's going to change, it's going to change us as a species. I, I think for the best, for the better, uh, we'll truly become a spacefaring uh, race, humankind. Um, and that, that's what I think, you know, the future holds for us. I hope if we don't blow it ourselves up, <laughs> you know, yeah, well, that's a wonderful nice place to, to leave it. The missiles offline though, if we, get out of line, right <laughs> exactly exactly listen i'm sure we'll still find a way life finds a way doesn't it yeah um, but that's a uh, great place to leave it Earl. thank you very much for joining me i'll have thank all you. the information you've talked about in the description to the podcast and i would ask if people you do have a sighting you want to report you should report it use mufon as a resource the mufon.com really easy to get there and fill that out as well so Earl, and it'll be great to have you back on in the near future again for i'd any love update. to come back so, been good speaking with you, Earl. Have a lovely day. Thank you for the you call. You too, guys. Andy. You have a wonderful day. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet, and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast of course on twitter it's at ufo uapam and again folks as always keep looking up you never know what you might see it wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer more like a hubcap designed by chaucer a little baroque and quite steampunk like alice was playing bass for the parliament of the little fucker hovered right outside of my window and when i shut out the screen he made it an issue i don't think he expected me to see his ass but i'd had some champagne and smoked a little more meditative game of state full on meta i can't imagine how it could have been any better i got to the top of the stairs and there he was I'm like you awake i was about to abduct you cuz back and nearly kissed myself and I climbed out the window after the elf and I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head and everything was weird and everything was red and I called up my boys, they thought this was noise, they thought it was a dream, they thought it was my toys, they thought it was my problems and they think I should take care of me and I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me. If you really want to know who I think they'd be against you and me, 